would like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, the last installment of the series we've been over the last few weeks. This is us. Uh, and today you have the Crystal David Marriage Edition. <laughs> and so we'll, and I would just say, when you kind of initially think about that, oh, well, I'm not married or I'm divorced or I'm widowed or I'm a young person, I'm not married yet. Uh, I would just encourage, as we've said each week, there's really principles that will help you, will help all of us in just relationships in general. So please don't, don't just check out. Just listen to what the Lord has to share uh, with you this morning. Uh, and I just want to, again, we've got a, some special guests with us. So I just want to give a big shout out to our Benton Heights campus. Uh, we have the ability now, the technology now to be able to, uh, to be live uh, with another campus. And so we have the privilege of being live with the Benton Heights campus. And so I just want to give a big shout out to them. I heard that, so when uh, Pastor Jaime, when he talks about, uh, you know, welcome to Benton Heights, uh, a lot of times the people will say back, campus will say back, the best place to be, and they're probably actually get, probably actually saying that as I'm talking, uh, the best place to be on a Sunday morning. And then Pastor Chris last week was out at Benton Heights, and I understand that he said, well, since uh, Benton Heights is the best place to be on a Sunday morning. I suppose the Stevensville campus is the second best place to be on a Sunday morning. And so welcome to First Church St. Joe campus, the third best place to be, I suppose. So, uh, but seriously, we're just really thrilled to have uh, Benton Heights with us. So thank you, thank you. It's a privilege to be able to uh, be with you uh, today, uh, Benton Heights. Uh, at the end, I'm going to throw it back to Rachel, and Rachel's going to lead out at Benton Heights, kind of you in a very personal um, uh, just a conclusion type time just for you. So I'll throw it back uh, toward the end. So here we are in this series. Yeah, I'm really excited to have a mic yeah. today. <laughs> he gets a chance all the time to say thanks. You guys are going to hear some stories today. Um, oh no. Yeah. Heaven so help us we or have, just me. We have actually uh, talked about some of this before. Uh, David and I taught a class on marriage a few years ago, and it's based on this book, Love and Respect, by Dr. Emerson Egger Riches. And um, this is just a great book. And um, just, just want to give you a little commercial. If you are a part of the First Church family, we have something that we would like to gift you, and that is a subscription to Right Now Media, which is the largest place online that houses more Christian um, content as far as video content, stuff for your children, marriages, family, women, men, all of that. And so you can have a subscription to that for free through First Church. And so if you, would if you don't have that already and you would like to have that, all you need to do is go to our website, www.myfirstchurch.com, click on the Info Hub, and it will scroll down, and you'll see Right Now Media. And you just click on that, and you can sign right up. And we are going to be talking about something called the crazy cycle today. And so what we did was we went on our First Church channel, and in the marriage section, we put as the number one series there something called the, the crazy cycle by... Dr. Emerson. And so if you would like to learn more about that after we get done, I don't know, maybe you'll think we did such a great job. You won't need any more information. Or I didn't understand that. I need to actually hear what you... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you need, if you didn't understand bonus us material. at all, yeah, it's bonus yeah. material. So we did put that on there for you. So just a little commercial. It's a great resource, and we would love for you to have it. So just be sure to sign up for that on our website. Um, and it's free. Yeah, and it's free. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. You're welcome. Um, so Michael, you guys, we're going to need you to laugh and give us something this morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We are going to have fun. We like to have fun. David and I do like to laugh a lot. Um, so anyway, let's start with a quote by Michael Kruger. And it says this, you don't drift into a good marriage. Marriage requires gospel saturated, grace motivated, scripture guided diligence. So together today, what we're going to do is we are going to seek to understand some of the gospel-saturated truth as it relates to marriage and relationships in general. So again, if you're not married, it, this is just, this is really good advice for relationships in general. So let me give you some really good advice, or let me just say, this is just the foundation of everything we're going to do this morning. And this may come as a shock to you. So are you ready? It's I'm very ready. profound. I'm, I'm sitting down, so okay. I'm ready. It's very profound. <laughs> Men and women are different. 
Okay. Did you know that? Let me illustrate it by <laughs> saying this. Um, when I say I have nothing to wear. What she means is I have nothing new. <laughs> and when I say I have nothing to wear. He means he has nothing clean. <laughs> so the way We're that different. we are very different. <laughs> the way that we see life is different. The way that we process what people say is different. Let me just say this. We had two boys. I grew up in a male dominated environment not grew up. Well, yeah, I, they did raise me a little bit, but I have lived in a male dominated environment for a very, very long time. And what I have learned is that guys speak a completely different language than me. It does not matter how old they are. It's completely different. There's this code that they use that, that I just really sometimes don't get. And it just because it's different doesn't make it wrong, right? I mean, it's, we're all different. And, but this is going to be the foundation for everything we're going to talk about today. God created us, and he created us different. There's a passage that we're going to really focus on, be the foundational point. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're just going to focus on that last verse, verse 33. And it says this. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says to us here in this letter of the defeat to the church at Ephesus, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, notice there's something we'll get into on both sides of this. There's something for husbands and there's something for wives. And he says to husbands, make sure you love your wives. And the word love that's used there, because in the Greek, and if you've been at church, in church for a while, you've probably heard some pastor somewhere along the way say that in the Greek, there are a few words that are all translated with the one word love. In English, we have this one word love, but in Greek, there's several words. And the word that he chooses to use here is agape. And agape love is the kind of love that is God, the kind of love that God has for us. There's another uh, Greek word, eros, that love that's where we get the word erotic. It's the love that you see on Hollywood, in Hollywood or television. It's that love that's just purely physical attraction. And then there's the love that's the phileo love from the Greek. And that uh, love is, as defined uh, in the Greek, just the, the brotherly affection, the, the friendship type of your love, the human love. But again, the word that he doesn't use those words, the word he uses here is agape. Husbands, agape your wives. Love your wives like God loves you. Love your wives with this pure, deep, sacrificial love. It's the love that was displayed on the cross when Christ gives his life, that sacrificial love. It's the same word used in John 3, 16 when, when it says, For God so loved the world, for God so agape the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the kind of love that husbands have been commissioned, have been mandated, have been told, love like this. Verse 25, we've got some other help that he, that Paul gives us. He tries to make it simple. In this 33rd verse, he says, uh, love, uh, love this way, love your wife as yourself. There's some other remedial help when he says in verse 25 and verse 28, if you just go up just before, and I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but in verse 25, he, he says to husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wow. What a way to illustrate the way we are to love. He says, husbands, in verse 28, love your wives as your own bodies. So as you think about those, those two ways to understand it a little deeper, when Paul says to, as Christ loved the church, love your wives like that, how, how, how does that inform the way that we love? If we loved like Jesus loved, if we gave ourselves, if, what did Jesus say? I didn't come to serve, be served, but I came to serve. What if we loved our wives in that serving, sacrificial, not in the, you know, what have you done for me lately, and I'll, you scratch my back, I'll scratch you. That's not the love that's described. And then he gives, again, remedial help here. He says, love like you love your own body. And husbands, if we were, if we were to be honest with one another today, if we just looked at the way we love, if we would just do what Paul says here, Think about how far down the road we would be to fixing issues in our relationships if we would just begin by loving like we've been told to love, by loving sacrificially, loving unconditionally. 
as Scripture tells us to love. There's a book that Chapman wrote. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's probably on right now media, so there's probably a teaching on it too, the five love languages. And those five love languages, what Chapman wrote was this, that, you know, talking about just that we, we give and receive love in different ways because we're different people with different personalities. So we give and receive love in different ways. And it's important for us to understand, husbands, as I'm talking to you, uh, what the love language of our wives are. Typically, what we, all of us do, is we typically want to give love or show love in the, the love language that we like to get. But what we need to do, if we're going to love sacrificially, we're going to consider that other person, then we need to seek to understand what the love language of our spouse is. So those love languages, as Gary as Chapman defines them, are one would be words of affirmation. Some of us, that's the way that we receive love, by when someone praises us, that that's, feels loving to us. Physical touch is another one. We get that. Receiving gifts. Anybody that you feel loved when you're getting a gift? <laughs> All right, there's, that's, I mean, some of us are, that's the way we are, sure, and that's no, no problem, you just need to understand uh, uh, in our relationships, quality time's another one, and then acts of service. Now, let me explain it uh, with tacos, okay? So, if I were, so let's say. I love this because uh, I love tacos. Uh, uh, Crystal, so if I was going to give words of affirmation to Crystal, I might say to her, your tacos were delicious. Thank you. So, Appreciate words that. of affirmation. Uh, if I were to think about uh, giving or re- giving love with acts of service, I might say, here, honey, I gave you, I made you some tacos. That would be amazing. Yeah. You never Except do that. Except that would probably never happen. Or okay. I don't know. If you did that, I don't know that I'd want to <laughs> You them, wouldn't say I amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, uh, so that would be the acts of service. And then re- uh, receiving gifts, I'd say, here's a taco. Yes. Okay. And then Thank quality you. time, I might, might say to you, hey, honey, let's go get some tacos together. Can we do that you after know? church? I would love that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, uh, the physical touch, I might say to you, hold me like a taco or I'll hold you like a taco or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, so that's just the... What does uh, that even fu- mean? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> I saw it on a t-shirt, actually. I was... I Googled the five love languages, I think I just, be and it was a T-shirt that came up, so I thought it was funny. Anyway, <laughs> I want to share with you. So, Crystal's love language is acts of service. So, we were doing this little home remodel project thing, and she wanted she wanted a shiplap wall in our bedroom. I'm not handy. Okay. Hang on. Can I get an amen about a shiplap wall? Anybody? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank so you. Crystal wanted the shiplap wall. Uh, and, and by the way, if I had a dime for every YouTube video I've watched on putting up a shiplap wall. Um, you guys would think he was studying for like his <laughs> doctorate or something before he put this wall up. But anyway, so, so I put up this, this shiplap wall and, and literally this, that, that shiplap wall is my is an enduring testament to my love for my wife. It is a standing monument right do, at the head of our bed. It is the monument yes, to yes, my love for you. Yes, it that is. Shape, my act of service. So, I, yeah, yes. Yeah. I appreciate it. So, again, I respect you for that. Thank you. Well. Yeah. So, we have we're different. We have basic needs. It doesn't mean that we don't also have the the other the other you know. Men don't have, you know, needs or women have these other needs. But we have just these basic needs generally, and it's this. And what we see in the scripture, the basic needs in marriage, men need respect. As Paul says, women, give your husbands this. And women need love. As he says, give your wives this. Yeah, so women, we are encouraged to respect our husbands. And if you go back to that scripture in Ephesians 5.33, I'm going to read it for you one more time. It says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So in this scripture, they use this Greek word that is also used when talking about a relationship with God. Here, specifically, it's talked about, it's talking about honoring someone or being respectful in a relationship So one way to understand this would be to say or to talk about what respecting your husband is not, what it isn't. And what it isn't is it's not showing your husband contempt. It's not showing them, browbeating them. It's not treating them like another child. (laughs) Um, Even though sometimes we act that way. Maybe. Or maybe that's just me. Okay, go ahead. Did you? So you understood my pause there? Yeah, I did. I, you were at one. Yeah. 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 So, but let me just say you mean this. The side eye. Scripture yeah. is also not talking about women being a doormat. 
It's not talking about us not being able to have an opinion in our marriage or not being able to disagree with our husbands at times or not being able to show any leadership in the home. That's not what this is talking about. And I think sometimes that is taken way out of context. So if we're talking about the current example of the shiplap wall, so I'll go back to the shiplap wall. In that, in that particular project, so what you need to know is that my dad is an avid DIYer. And when I say DIYer, I mean he's good at it. And I was the oldest of two daughters, two girls, and they used to joke that I was my dad's token boy because I would play basketball with him in the driveway and he would teach me how to fit. He taught me how to like change my oil and my tire, which by the way, every dad should teach their daughter those things, I think. But anyways, um, he did all those things with me. And then we bought a house one summer and we did the renovations in the house across the street from our house. Like it was, we took, we took this dilapidated home. It was the worst one on the street and my dad bought it and we filled it, we fixed it as a family. So I have learned a few things from my dad. Now, let me just say, there were things that I would have done different in putting up the ship level. <laughs> but I never said, Pop would not do it that way. I never said that. I never said, don't do you it. You probably have to admit you thought it, though. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I thought it, but I didn't say it. And that's what we mean here about the respect. I mean, it's just sometimes it's keeping your mouth shut when you want to say things that maybe you shouldn't say. And that's just a one simple illustration of what respect looks like. If you notice in the scripture, it says, wives, see to it. And in most translations, that phrase is actually translated, you must respect your husband. Now, the word that is not used in that scripture is if. It doesn't say, wives, respect your husbands if they earn it. It doesn't say, wives, respect your husbands if they, if, they, if they love you enough. It doesn't say, wives, respect your husbands if they're the spiritual leaders in the home. And it also, here, ladies, just hear me. Sometimes we think these things like, I'll be a hypocrite if I respect them because they, they just, they haven't earned it. And that's our traditional thinking. But I would challenge you, biblically, it says that we should respect our husbands. And showing respectful behavior, even when we don't feel like it, by the way, is not hypocrisy, it's maturity. It's not hypocrisy, it's maturity. Because sometimes putting our feelings on the back burner needs to happen. I, um, I think uh, uh, Priscilla Shire said this in a Bible study, and I actually just thought of this. I didn't share. David hates it when I go off my notes. <laughs> Buckle in, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Priscilla Shire said, feelings don't have intellect. So when you, when you react out of your feelings, it's probably not a smart thing. And so probably when you begin to have those feelings that rise up inside of you that you would want to say this disrespectful thing, you should probably zip the lips and think about it for just two seconds. Is the way that I'm about to say it. doesn't mean you can't say it, but how you say it means a lot. Now, please don't misunderstand here. Um, don't, don't, don't assume that we're saying that men don't need love and women don't need respect. Because obviously we, we probably all need those things. But what we're saying is here that God, again, just like we said at the beginning, that God made us different and we have those basic needs. But women, we love more naturally than men do. And men respect more naturally than women than women do. It's just that vice versa. And again, we're just different. We just have these different basic needs. Okay, so we can throw that slide back up again. So the basic needs in marriage, as we see that Paul helps us with, is in this reminder, men need respect, women need love. So let's think about that. When we consider um, this basic need that men have for respect, uh, most, of, most husbands don't generally uh, wonder if their wives love them. They know that their wives love them, but they might wonder, does she really like me? And that's just another way of saying, does she respect me? There's a study that was done several years ago where they forced uh, men to answer and, and to choose one of two negative situations. And if they were forced to, to make a choice, uh, which one that they would prefer to endure if they had to make a choice one, the choice was to be left alone and unloved in the world, or two, to feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone. And this is so interesting. 
74% of men said that they were forced to choose that they would prefer being alone and unloved in the world. For them, the greater negative was living with a feeling of inadequacy and being disrespected. In uh, Emerson's book, he talks about then born out through, you know, decades of, uh, you know, counseling and talking to men that he just talked about how that bore out. That men that he observed would rather, again, have a wife that respected them, but they didn't necessarily feel loved them than a wife that they knew loved them but had no respect for them. Perfect way to illustrate that would be, uh, again, just to generically, we're just talking generically here about these, these, these differences. You know, think about the commander who goes into, the, uh, into the, 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 the men who are about to go into the front lines of battle and just potentially give their lives in this battle. You know, the motivation, the, the motivating talk is, you know, I believe in you, you can do it. And, and these words that communicate respect and, and honor, unconditional honor. Again, men have this basic need for respect. Yeah, and women have a basic need for love. And the key question that most women ask is, do, does my husband love me as much as I love him? Now, she knows that she loves him, but oftentimes she wonders does he love me as much as, as I love him? Um, and, and there are those, those, those things that go on in our mind of ways that that is illustrated in our relationship. And guys, you may not even realize this, that you are illustrating your love for your wife in these ways. Um, just an illustration of this um, anniversary date that happened at a 15th and a wedding anniversary, which has been quite a long time for us. Um, but we still do the same thing. So this couple was in the car, and he says, honey, Let's go out for a steak dinner. Where do you want to go? And she says what I usually say. Well, you pick. Yeah. Okay. So he says, well, that truck stop down the road has a great steak dinner. <laughs> and she gets upset. Except he d- did exactly what she said to do. Yes, she did. She did say pick. But what she meant was, honey, if you love me as much as I love you, you will know exactly where I want to go. And is that it's not super confusing? <laughs> just, it would be so much easier if yeah. you just tell us. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you love me, you would know where I want to go. Yeah, and it's similar to, so, so I get Okay, wait, our, he's off notes now. Yeah, what are so you about I to get say? A, I get a, so I get up early, go to the gym, I come back home. And then later in, the, later in the day, Crystal's like, did you not notice that my car was low on gas? Because her car's in the garage, and so it was warm, and so it was cold outside. Anyway, uh, so I said, no, I didn't, I didn't notice that. And she was, admit it, you're a little sideways with me. I admit it, because and I got in my she, car, and I literally, <laughs> you know that little light that flashes that tells you you're about to be stuck on the side of the road with no gas? That was the light that I, was I don't flashing. recall seeing the light, but anyway... I, I said to her, anytime, I, absolutely, I will not feel bad. You just tell me when you want. I'll, I'll go gas up your car. Anytime you need it, just yeah, tell me I feel like that, if, that your gas is low. I'll I gladly know. go gas up your car. Yes, I get that. But in that moment, I felt like if he loved me as much as I love him, <laughs> he would notice my gas light was on when he took my warm car out of the garage and went to the gym. Yeah. And I had to get out in the cold to fill it up, by the way. Yeah, so again, super confusing, but this is... But I respect this, this you. This is what we're dealing with here. All right. I respect you. So let's talk about this, uh, this crazy cycle that we mentioned earlier. And here it is. Here's that crazy cycle defined. Without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. So think of it this way. So you walk in a room, lights are out, you flip the switch... Light doesn't come on. So the natural thing to do is to flip the switch a couple more times to see if the light comes on. Now, that would be normal to flip it a couple times. But if you stood there for 30 minutes, flipping it back and forth and back and forth, kind of like I do, hoping Crystal's dad shows up to fix the switch. But anyway, if you just stood there and just flipped it incessantly, that was a lot funnier than you guys. Okay. So if you just flip the switch incessantly and it never came on, that would be crazy. And that's this crazy cycle. It's what we do in marriage. Men, they're standing there and they're flipping the switch, trying to get their wives to respect them in ways that don't show love. And they just continue to flip the same switch. 
And women in the marriage are trying to get their husbands to show love, but they're not uh, uh, doing things. They're not showing the, uh, you're not, they're, they're not showing that, uh, you know, doing things that just inspire that, them with respect to love. And so again, each of us ignoring the basic needs of the other, wondering why in the world they don't change. As we try to get the light to come on in our spouse. But at the same time, again, flipping the wrong switch over and over and over, which is a definition of insanity, doing the same things we've always done, done, expecting different results. And so when we consider again these basic needs that we have, the basic needs of women, the basic need of love, and when the husband comes across as unloving, what's the typical reaction? Again, we're talking in general generalities, but the typical reaction, uh, you know, might be some, some negative reaction. So the reaction might be uh, in that moment when she's not feeling love to, to, to come back with, uh, with uh, complaining or maybe criticizing or to motivate the husband to be more loving. And so whenever a wife is complaining or criticizing, it's coded message for I want you to love me. I want your love. And then a husband, we react in typical ways when our wives don't meet our basic need for respect. And we try to, to motivate them. And you, just, you know, and not that we're consciously necessarily doing this, but, but we want them to show us respect. And so we, we have this characteristic behavior, this behavior of maybe speaking harshly to our wives. Or stonewalling them, or not speaking at all. At times, we just just remove ourselves from the situation, and we walk away with the thought, "Well, I know if I walk away from this, that that, that that's not going to go well. It's, that's not going to be good. That I'm going to be in trouble for that. But I'll be in more trouble if I say something. Or that's just me. <laughs> Have you ever felt that?" that I'll be in more in trouble, more trouble if I just say something again. What are we doing? We're standing there flipping the light switch and it's not working. So when a husband is short or dismissive or sarcastic or sometimes not saying anything at all, what the coded message is, I want your respect. Now let me give you a little disclaimer as we think about all of this. There are uh, probably in a crowd this size, and especially as we are again loving that our Benton Heights family is, is on with us as well, then in a crowd this size, that there is undoubtedly abuse in this crowd. That there are uh, some individuals that are in an abusive situation. And, and predominantly, you look at, you know, studies and statistics, that's predominantly men who are being, and not always the case, but most of the case, time, that's men. And so, I just, if you, uh, and whether that's, whether that's verbal abuse or, you know, physical abuse or psychological abuse, whatever it is, I just want to encourage you, if you're in that crazy cycle, uh, please talk to one of us, some of the, somebody on staff. Uh, there's counselor, tremendous counselors in town. Talk to someone. Let us help you. Uh, and if you are abusing your spouse or your kids, uh, and regardless of what has gone on in your past, God can help you find victory. You need help. Do not continue in that situation. If you're in that, let us help you, okay? So just a little disclaimer. We need to get out of those situations. Let us help you to, to figure that out. We'd love to help you. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the things that is really important as we talk about this is just the idea of humility that, you know, there is, it takes humility to say we need help. And I think that's one, when we talk about this crazy cycle and how do you get off of it, so if we're standing in our marriages and we're flipping those switch, switches and we're, we're doing the same things over and over, expecting different results and it's not working, how do we get off of that crazy cycle? And I would, I would say humility is, a, is one thing that you need, a characteristic that you would need to help you get out of that crazy cycle. But let, let us just give you four just really simple ways to get out of that crazy cycle. And the first one would be to decide to act and react in different ways. We have to learn to, to flip a different switch. And I don't think that David and I, we've talked with a lot of couples before they've gotten married, and I don't think that any couple ever goes into marriage thinking that they want their marriage to fail. 
Nobody ever goes into their marriage thinking that they're going to be unfaithful, at least not most normal people. They don't go in thinking, I'm going to be unfaithful as they get married. Those things just happen along the way. And so if you just, if you're in that crazy cycle, we have to decide to act and react in different ways. Both people in the marriage, you're both goodwilled and you want it to work out. And we see that over and over again. But again, remember at the very beginning, we said that men and women are different and we have different basic needs. It's the way God made us. Again, it's not wrong. It's just different. And it's, it's not bad, it's just different. And we have to start working to meet those basic needs, which means we're going to have to start acting and reacting differently, not expecting your husband or wife to be like you or react like you, but instead realize that you're different and begin to choose on your own and have the humility to act or react in a different way. And second, you have to have faith in God's Word. I mean, God's Word is a good thing. And he has so much good to say, and we just have to have faith that the way that he has designed marriage, the way that he's outlined it in his word, it's a good thing. And we have to have faith in God's word. And that may mean that I'll treat my spouse in ways that seem unnatural for me at first. I mean, it may feel unnatural for you to show respect to a husband that you feel like hasn't earned your respect, or husbands, it may feel really unnatural to you to act loving toward a wife that has pushed you away over and over, time and time again. It would be an act of the will to show your spouse love or respect. But do we have enough faith? Do we have enough faith in the truth of Scripture that it works practically in our lives? And I would say that that is a key ingredient to getting out of the crazy cycle. And then third... Somebody has to make the first move. Now, this third bit of practical advice as we seek to apply Scripture to, mar- to, to, to marriage is that you have to be willing to make that first move. So it would be this, the, another way to think of it is that the most mature person in the relationship needs to make the first move. Which we always think that we're the most mature, so that would yeah. be all of us, yeah. Yeah, so if you think you're the most mature person in the relationship, you need to make the first move in order to get off that crazy cycle. And the last piece of advice that I would give you would be to trust the Lord to overcome your fears. And just fear that you'll be a doormat or fear that things will never change or fear that you're going to be a hypocrite or you're going you're gonna to be taken advantage of or that if you show respect or that you start to give love, that you're just a hypocrite if you do that. But what I would say, again, is that you're not being a hypocrite. You're being mature. It's maturity, not hypocrisy. So some of you may have other fears that come from your family of origin, but I would just say that you you just have to choose. You have to make that decision to give it over to the Lord so that you can overcome that fear. So there's just to kind of get down to summarizing then how do we get out of this crazy cycle here's the key we just go back to uh, ephesians chapter 5 verse 33 and do what we've been told to do so for husbands that means that we need to love unconditionally that's the way it's described that agape love to love unconditionally to show our spouse that love like god has loved us like christ uh, loved the church giving himself up for it Um, even before it had done anything for him Christ loved. And so that's the way we are to love. Unconditional love, no matter what's going on, no matter what we're getting back from our spouses, that we will make the decision to love unconditionally. And for you ladies, then, to give unconditional respect. And for some of you, you're going to struggle with that. To struggle, again, this whole respect thing and to think of unconditional uh, respect. But I want you to think of it this way. So imagine, uh, it's, 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 you might say, well, I, lo- I love my husband, but I don't respect him. So if you turn that around, if your husband said to you, well, I respect you, but I just don't love you, how would that feel? Again, you ladies, if your husband said, well, I respect you, but I just don't love you, how devastating that would be. And again, to turn that to the needs of the guy Husbands are equally devastated when we communicate that. We're not, we would never say that, but to communicate that, I love you, but I have no respect for you. Men aren't, we're not known for communicating our feelings, so what do we do a lot of times? We just kind of walk away and we let that become this root of bitterness. Yeah, so going back to the scripture, husbands, you must love your wives unconditionally and wives, you must respect, and wives, you must respect your husbands. And it's, it's a command, not a suggestion. 
And again, we need to have faith that God's word works. And when we say to our husbands, I'll respect you when you've earned my respect, it's a lose-lose proposition. Because what that makes him responsible for is both the love and the respect. He's responsible for everything in the relationship, and that's a lose-lose proposition. And it's the same way for wives. Guys, you cannot put all of the burden on our shoulders to show both respect and love because then that makes us responsible for everything in the relationship. And it's just a lose-lose proposition because no one person can shoulder all of that. So we're going to, I said we would turn things back over. We want to turn things back over to Rachel at Benton Heights. Again, just thrilled, Benton Heights, that you were able to be with us uh, this weekend. God bless you. It's a joy to be one a church in multiple locations. We are better together. Thank you, uh, Benton Heights. And so, Rachel, you go ahead and just uh, give a little final word to the, the campus there. And then uh, let me give a final word uh, for us here at St. Joe. The task that we think of here in our marriage is really is overwhelming when we think about doing it on our own. This passage where Paul is writing the church at Ephesus, he was writing to followers of Christ. And so, Crystal, if you're here today and you've never invited Christ to be your Savior, Crystal is going to pray for us in a minute, and she's going to give all of us a chance. If you've never invited Christ to be your Savior, um, to, to do that. And so that's a great starting point. But just know that these words are, are nigh to impossible unless we have some help beyond ourselves. And Christ wants to help us. The power of the Holy Spirit is available to us. If we want to do marriage unto Christ, we need Christ in our marriages. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I think that really applies in our marriages at a healthy, a good uh, relationship. We need absolutely his help. And so we're going to just call on the Lord. And Chris is going to pray for us and ask for that help. And I would say to you as well, no matter what your marital status or lack thereof is today, if you're widowed or divorced or you're single and you've never been married and maybe aspire to be or someone, someone Maybe you, uh, like Paul said, I, I'm, you know, single's a good thing, and it, and it, and it absolutely can be. And, and so, so maybe that's, you don't even have any expectations, and that's okay too. You need to do what the Lord has, is laying on your heart. But all I would say to you is we all need help, and we can all find some help in the Scriptures. We apply it to our relationships. And maybe there's someone in your sphere of influence that's got a marriage that's really struggling. You could point them to what we've talked about today point them to scripture, of course, but what we've talked about today, where they might get some help. So we all need the Lord's help, the empowering the Holy Spirit to help to put into practice what we know in scripture is true. Trust God's word. And so let's get off the crazy cycle. Let's put God's word into practice. And God's word, as we put into practice, can take a lousy marriage, can make it good, and take a good marriage and can make it great. And what is it? What's Ephesians say? Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as you love yourself. You all love your wives as your own body. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and wives respect your husband. So let's men make the decision to love unconditionally regardless of what we receive. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask the praise team to go ahead and come up. I remember a few years ago, I mean, David and I now this year um, will be married 31 years. Um, We got married when we were 21 we're still really young, I think, even though I had a birthday last week. Um, we, we didn't do things so good at first. Um, we had been married about three years, and David and I, you know, we, we each have our own family of origin, and his family of origin, you know, their relationship was much different than my parents' relationship, and so we came into our marriage with completely different expectations. And I remember, uh, you know, we were in in youth ministry. We had kids in our house all the time. We love teenagers, by the way. Love teenagers. But we had kids in our house all the time. We were newlyweds still pretty much. And I was in nursing school. And if if you've been in nursing school, you know how difficult that is. And so we were really just at odds a lot. And I went home to my parents' house one weekend, and I sat down at their kitchen table. And I... I remember I was telling them all that was going on and my mom and dad are very wise people and I I said to them, I'm just really praying that God would change David's heart. And, you know, they're my parents. They're supposed to take my side, right? Well, my mom, she reached across the table and she rubbed my arm and she said, Crystal, you know I love you, right? 
But she said, have you ever thought to pray that God would change your heart? She said, because what I've learned is that when God changes my heart, he changes your dad's heart in the process. And I just thought that was really great advice. It wasn't what I was expecting, (laughs) but it was really great advice. So as you sit in this room today and your spouse may be with you or they may not be, and maybe you're thinking in your mind, yeah, I wish my spouse would respect me more. Yeah, I wish my spouse would love me more. Well, let me be my mom. My mom's name is Claudia. I'm going to be Claudia to you right now. Have you ever thought to change, ask God to change your heart? Because in the process, I believe that we serve a faithful God who will honor that prayer. And in the process, you may be surprised to find that he will change the heart of your spouse as you begin to lovingly embrace them in a way that speaks to their love language. I believe that God is faithful. I believe he can heal marriages. I believe that he can make us greater. I mean, we're not perfect. I really like this guy <laughs> after 31 years. he's my. I tell him all the time when he walks out the door, what do I say to you? You're my treasure. Yeah, he's my treasure. Or my favorite. Yes, I do say, I say both, treasure and favorite. He's my favorite. But I think still, David and I, one of the things that makes our marriage so successful, because you guys were together 24-7, we work together, don't know if you realize that. (laughs) But one of the things that makes us work is that we are constantly striving to be better, better believers, better Christ lovers, to look more and more like Jesus. And in the process, we're constantly working to make our marriage look more like him. And I'm not just saying that that's not just lip service. If you could be in our home, you would see that playing out. And I believe today in this room that God can do the same thing in your heart and life. Even if you think your marriage is perfect, we all have room to grow. And life can get sweeter and sweeter. We don't have kids at home. We're empty nesters. And we're really having some fun. And I think that marriage can get better from this point forward. So I'm going to say this too to you. If you don't know Jesus, one of the best ways to make your marriage better is for Jesus to be the center of it. And if you don't know him, there is no better time to accept him as your Lord and Savior because that can make all the difference in the world in your marriage is for you to be a growing, vibrant, thriving servant of the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and Don't look around, and I'm just going to ask you this question. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, if you would like to accept him as your Savior, I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up right where you are. I'm not going to call you out or anything, but if you would just like to accept Jesus as your Savior, just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up. And now I'm going to ask you, if you're in this space with your spouse, I'm going to ask you to take them by the hand. And if you're not, I'm just going to ask that you don't take the hand of another person. But, you know, (laughs) think about your spouse and where they are right now. And I want to pray for you. And also, I, I want to pray over those of you that are single or maybe you're divorced or you're grieving the loss of a spouse. I just want to pray over us today and dedicate our lives to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this time and we thank you for this sweet space and we thank you for the way that you teach us in your word. And Father, today I pray in Jesus' name a blessing over every marriage represented in this room, whether we're together or we're apart, Father. I pray in Jesus' name that you would bring healing, that you would bring growth, that you would bring blessing on these marriages. And Father, I pray for the brokenhearted. I pray for those that have experienced divorce. And I pray in Jesus' name, Father, we know that you can redeem, that you can make beauty from ashes. And so, Father God, today in Jesus' name, I proclaim healing and victory, Father, in those lives, Father God. And Father, I pray over those that are grieving the loss of a spouse. I pray that you would heal their hearts, that you would mend them. And Father, that you would encourage them. And those that are single in this space, that maybe just want to love you and serve you in their singleness. I pray that you would bless them and encourage them. And also, Father, those that are waiting on their spouse, that, Father, you would prepare their spouse even today for these teenagers. Father, God, prepare their future spouse. Bring them someone that loves you most of all. And, Father, today we just commit this time to you and we say to you we love you, Father God. 
We thank you for the design that you created for marriage. We commit ourselves to you today for that. In Jesus' precious name we pray.